We come to our fourth lesson in the study of salvation, which in theology it's called soteriology, from the word soteria, which means to save. And we're really studying the most grand subject of all. This is the study of New Testament salvation, how God can redeem and save a sinner. And certainly if salvation is not a big issue, there's really no reason for the church to be here. There is no reason for Christians to witness and testify of God's grace. No reason for preachers to preach the gospel if God does not save. And if there is no hell and if there is no sin problem, there is no reason for salvation either. But we know that all those things are true. There is a hell, there is a sin problem, and there is a Savior and His name is Jesus Christ and His precious blood was shed on the cross as the atonement to save our souls. Somebody said this, A poet can take a worthless piece of paper, write a poem on it, and instantly make it worth thousands of dollars. That's called genius. A banker could sign his name to a piece of paper and make it worth millions of dollars, and it's called riches. A mechanic can take a material worth only $5 and make it worth $500, and they call that skill. An artist can take a 50 cent piece of canvas, paint a picture on it, and make it worth thousands of dollars, and they call that art. But Jesus Christ can take a worthless, sinful life, a degenerated life, wash it in His precious blood, put His Holy Spirit within that person, and it's called God's salvation. The most important thing that's ever happened to me in my life is God saving my soul. And if you're saved, that's the most important thing that's ever happened to you. By way of review, we begin talking about the origin of salvation. Where does this come from? And the subject title was coerced or compelled. In other words, are you forced into this? Are you predetermined and chosen before the foundation of the world and really have no say-so? Or are you simply compelled and asked and prodded by the Lord to trust Him? And that dealt with the origin of salvation. It's kind of like um, illustrated this way. There's this man, he's out fishing by the river bank. And as the tide's coming in, the river's swelling up some. And the uh, river has this, uh, this tree where he's fishing. The roots kind of wrap around and go down into the bank. And there, there's this scorpion down there. The water's coming up, getting closer and closer. So this man's leaning over. And he's trying to get this scorpion out of harm's way. and just wants to put him up on land. And every time he reaches down there, the scorpion tries to bite him. And there's a guy over there close to him, and he says, what are you doing? You're crazy. He goes, don't you know it's in the nature of that scorpion to try to attack you? And he says, yeah, but it's in my nature to try to save him. That's how it is with God. It's in our nature to rebel and to gravitate towards sin and toward wickedness, but it's in God's nature to save. Jesus said he came to seek and to save that which was lost. Our, our second lesson dealt with the theories of salvation. We talked some about theology and some of the different theories that people propose that is the plan of salvation. And we identified in theology the biblical theory, which is called evangelicalism. And it has to do with the belief in the gospel of Jesus Christ that saves. And then we dealt with last week the atonement of Christ. What is the basis of all this? How can God save us? What are the grounds by which He's able to redeem us from our sins and to save us from hell? The grounds is the atonement of Jesus Christ that He died as a substitutionary death on the cross and His blood as the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without spot was shed in your place as an atonement. He took your place. God's wrath and judgment was poured out on Jesus Christ and He died. He was buried and thank God He rose again from the dead, conquering sin, hell, death, and the grave. And by faith, when you believe that, you're saved. So that's kind of where we're going to get to today, which is how to be saved. And we call that um, appropriation of salvation. Appropriation. This comes from the word appropriate. And so how do you apply something and appropriate something to yourself? How do you get this salvation of God? 
That's the question. Our text will be Acts chapter 16, a very familiar passage. In verse number 30, Acts chapter 16, now this passage is where Paul and Silas are locked up in jail. And they've been preaching the gospel. And as they go through the night, at midnight, they just take a prayer meeting and turn it into a praise meeting. And they sing and they pray and, and they preach. And this jailer evidently heard them. You'll notice in verse number 29. Then he called for a light and sprang in and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas. Verse 30. And brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved and thy house. So we're talking about the fact that God can save us, but how do we get saved? It's uh, okay to say, what must I do to be saved? Someone that says, well, you're saying that there are works that you do. No, we're going to clear that up in a minute. Uh, we're saved by grace through faith, that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works lest any man should boast, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. But it's appropriate to say, what must I do to be saved? The usage is, that's how you would ask. So this term saved, or save, you don't see that term or hear that term in a lot of modern Christianity. It's a little too pointed for people. They want to use terms a little more easy, like, are you a Christian? Are you a believer? A very pointed question is, are you saved or have you been saved? That implies there's something that you need to be saved from. And that, of course, leads to the logical conclusion from the Bible that the wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. That leads to the logical conclusions, Revelation chapter number 20, whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. It has to do with being saved or rescued or delivered from the penalty and the punishment of your sin, which is hell. So when we talk about being saved, that's what we're referring to. Now, I'll give you a few verses here. Acts chapter 4, verse number 12. We may hit this one again later on. Acts 4, 12. Neither is there salvation in any other, speaking of Christ, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Peter makes a declaration in Acts 15, verse number 11, as they have a council talking about how God is now dealing with the Gentiles. And as a Jew, he makes this statement because the Gentiles had believed on Christ by faith. He makes this statement, Acts 15, verse 11. But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved, even as they. Paul's epistles, Romans chapter 5, verse 9. Much more then, being now justified by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. And then Romans 10, a very classic passage. Romans chapter number 10, verse number 9, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised Him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. So it's perfectly appropriate, as we talk about appropriation, to use the word save and saved. Now, it, it may be kind of pointed when you ask someone point blank, are you saved? Uh, you might want to kind of lead into that conversation a little bit if you have a little bit of time to talk about things and ask them, has there ever been a point in your life where you know that you were saved from the penalty of your sins? Uh, are you saved? Have you been saved? That's definitely an appropriate question. 1 Corinthians 1.18, Paul said, The preaching of the cross is of them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved. So it's common to refer to believers in Jesus Christ as the ones who are saved. And yes, that does discriminate. That makes a difference. We hate those words now. Uh, difference and discriminations, and we want to just blend everything together. But everybody's not the same. A man is not a woman, and a woman is not a man. A boy is not a girl, a girl is not a boy, a, a, an adult is not a child, a child is not an adult. And to say an unsaved person is a saved person is not true. If a person is saved, that means they have been rescued by the, their faith in the atonement of Jesus Christ and they're on their way to heaven, they're not on their way to hell. An unsaved person has not been delivered or rescued from the penalty of their sins and when they die, they will go to a place the Bible calls hell, a place of fire and torment. And they will pay for their sins because the payment of their sins, Jesus Christ, has not been appropriated to them. 
It's not been put on their account. Their account is still full of their sins. Their account has not been cleared or redeemed or remitted of their transgressions. And so that's a good word to use. Um, Ephesians chapter 2 verse number 8. By grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. Titus 3, 5, not by works of righteousness which we've done, but according to His mercy, He saved us. Now, there are some cases where the word save and saved is used in the Bible and in the New Testament particularly, and it's not referring to being saved from hell. Paul tells Timothy one time, he says, In doing this thou shalt save thyself and those that hear thee. He's talking about saving themselves from destruction as far as the ministry and making a shipwreck in their doctrine. And so the word saved is used like we use it oftentimes. Yeah, I saved that cat from being taken to the pound. I took it to its rightful owner. You didn't save the cat from hell. You rescued the cat. You delivered the cat. They told Christ when he was hanging on the cross in Matthew 27, he saved others himself he cannot save. They're talking about him being able to deliver himself. He delivered others from all kind of problems, from death, from infirmities. They're not speaking of punishment after death. Uh, the Bible tells us here in um, Acts chapter number 27 when Paul and, and uh, Luke and, and the other uh, folks are out and even prisoners are out on the ship there. In Acts chapter 27 when the storm comes, when neither sun nor stars in many days appeared and so no small tempest lay on us, all hope that we should be saved was then taken away. They, were, they thought, you know, there's no way we're going to get out of this. We're not going to be saved. We're not going to be delivered from this, this storm. So the word saved is used that way. The Bible talks about Noah and those eight souls being saved by water. 1 Peter 3, verse number 20. They were saved physically. In their physical life, they were delivered from the judgment of the flood. And then in Jude, verse number 5, the people of Israel were saved out of Egypt. They were delivered, redeemed out of Egypt and brought out into the wilderness to get away from Pharaoh. Now, we want to talk about two basic things. Really, the message only has two points. And those two points are repent or repentance and receiving. So there's repentance and faith. And that's what we're going to look at. Repentance. Take your Bible, if you will, and Turn over to Acts chapter number 20. You're in Acts 16, so just a couple chapters over. We'll look at a few verses here. Acts chapter 20. This is Paul. He's talking to the Ephesian elders, and he's kind of giving his farewell address, and he's getting ready to go to um, Jerusalem and eventually be arrested and put in jail and so forth. But this is the last time he's going to be at Ephesus, and he tells them some things. He says in verse number 20, and how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have showed you and have taught you publicly and from house to house. Here's what Paul preached and taught. Look at it, verse 21. Testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks. That's everybody. You're either a Jew or Gentile if you're not saved. Only three groups in this earth, Jew, Gentile, and church. And if you're saved, you're neither Jew nor Gentile. You're one in Christ. So here he's preaching to people, two groups. That's everybody. They're not saved. Look at this. Repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. So the Bible talks about this same thing in Acts 11 verse 18 about repentance unto life. So we're going to talk about repentance and we're going to talk about faith. Those are two sides of one coin. We're going to talk about repentance and faith or repentance and receiving Christ. So when we talk about repentance, what does it mean to repent? Now you can see the word Obviously, repent, when we say repentance. So the word repent is there. And that word in its very fundamental meaning is defined real early on in the Bible. In Genesis chapter 6, you recall when God was going to send the flood to flood out and judge the world. The Bible says it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth. Genesis 6 verse 6. The Lord repented. Now we know the Lord didn't repent of sin or of uncleanness, or of wickedness, but he changed his mind. Exodus chapter 13, verse number 17. The Bible uses this real early on, so when you find a couple of these early references, it's good to look at them. Uh, Exodus chapter 13, verse 17, when Israel comes out of Egypt, the Bible says, Pharaoh 
Excuse me, it came to pass when Pharaoh had let the people go, God led them not through the way of the land of the Philistines, although that was near. For God said, lest peradventure the people repent when they see war and they return to Egypt. That has to do with changing of the mind. They're going this way and he says, if they see this, then they may turn around. God repented that he made man on the earth. He's like, I did this, this was my plan. I'm going to change the plan. And he takes Noah and he destroys everyone except Noah and his sons. So repentance in that very fundamental sense has to do with a change of mind. A change of mind. Turning around. So when you think about repentance... That's what you want to think of. Now, the word repentance oftentimes has been just because of our... And you don't want to just say, okay, let's just study the Bible without understanding what pe how people talk and what religion says. You have to be a little bit aware of these things. People oftentimes, like I mentioned before, when they say the word church, they're talking about the Roman Catholic Church. Well, you know that's not the truth. But that's how people talk, so sometimes you have to be specific. And sometimes people, when they think about repentance, they think of the word penance. Repentance is not penance. Penance is in Roman Catholicism, and that is a self-punishment, a physical self-punishment to show on the outside a repentive heart on the inside. You can be repentative or repentant, I should say, and not exercise penance. Penance is not a good thing. Repentance is a good thing. So you want to make sure you understand that. Penance also in Catholicism has to do with a sinner, a person going to a priest and confessing his sins to the priest in order for the priest to absolve them or forgive those sins in his behalf. That is not New Testament Christianity at all. So repentance is not penance. Repentance is a change of mind. Repentance is turning around. Now, let me give you this as well. Repentance is not the act of trying to stop sinning. Someone's done something bad, maybe on a consecutive basis, and they, they start trying to stop sinning. That's not repentance. And let me say this, repentance is not feeling sorry for your sins. Although those last two things I gave you, there are elements of truth in those. As we study repentance, we'll see those elements played out. But repentance is not just weeping and feeling sorry and having over much sorrow in your heart. You say, how do you know this? Well, the Bible tells us about Pharaoh, and he says, I have sinned. We know that he didn't repent. And if he did repent, it wasn't the, the right type of repentance because he chased after the nation of Israel. We know about Balaam, the wicked false prophet that went around the way to get a gain of money and told Balak how he could get God to jump on his people. Balaam made the statement, I have sinned. Whenever God confronted him before he was even getting into trouble and he knew he wasn't supposed to go with those men, he said, I have sinned. He still got into trouble. What about Judas? Judas Iscariot, when he betrayed the innocent blood, the blood of Christ, he said, I have sinned. But he didn't have the right type of sorrow. So you want to be real careful with this thing of repentance. People get all out of whack concerning repentance, but repentance is connected to salvation. And I'm going to show you that. Repentance is preached all through the Bible, by the way. Over in Ezekiel, chapter 14, verse number 6, the Bible says, Thus saith the, excuse me, therefore say unto the house of Israel, Thus saith the Lord God, Repent and turn yourselves from your idols, and turn away your faces from all your abominations. There's a change of mind, and there's a turning around. Here's where the problem comes in. Because belief should and does affect behavior. This is where people get all out of bounds in forcing works into salvation. But we'll, 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 we will revisit that. Just keep that in mind. When they said repent, they said you need to change your mind. And that means you need to change your ways. 
If it's wrong to drink and you repent of drinking, that means you don't drink anymore. Now, John the Baptist preached repentance. When he shows up in the New Testament, he's preaching, repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. When Jesus Christ shows up and begins to preach after he is baptized, he says the same thing, repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. What about Paul the Apostle? Well, I gave you a verse in Acts chapter 20, verse 28. I'll give you another one, Acts chapter 17, Paul preaching, verse number 30. In the times of this ignorance, God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to to repent. So when's he preaching? He's preaching in the church age. That's when he's preaching. And he preaches repentance. Because he hath appointed a day in which he would judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, and that he hath raised him from the dead. Jesus Christ, when he gave his commission in Luke chapter 24, look over there real fast, Luke 24. That previous reference, by the way, was Acts 17, 30, and 31. If you're taking notes, Luke chapter 24, notice here the commission of Christ. Luke chapter 24, notice in verse 47. Luke 24, 47. Luke 24, 47. And that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. So when Paul preached in Acts 17 and he said... Now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. He is fulfilling part of that commission there in Luke chapter 24. Repentance preached among all nations. Now in Acts chapter 11 verse number 18, I gave you part of the verse earlier. It mentioned repentance unto life. That's why I'm mentioning repentance first and then we're mentioning faith and receiving Christ second. Now in that passage, Acts 11, verse number 18, the Bible says, When they heard these things, they held their peace and glorified God, saying, Then hath God also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life. This is where the Calvinists get on board and they say, See, a person can't be saved unless God grants that repentance and he grants the repentance to the elect. So therefore, the reason you get saved is you're irresistibly overcome by the Holy Spirit. You're regenerated, and then your depraved will is able to make a decision to trust Christ. So you really don't make that decision at all. The decision's already been made for you. That is hogwash. God granted repentance in that passage when you look at it. It's the Jews understanding that God is now allowing the Gentiles who previously, Matthew chapter number 10, I think I gave you that before in one of the messages recently, that the gospel was only sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. It was not sent to the Samaritans nor to the Gentiles. But now God is allowing the Gentiles corporately as a group to receive the gospel has nothing to do with before the foundation of the world, God's picked a few, and now He's granting you to repent because if He didn't grant you the ability to do it, you couldn't do it on your own. You can't make the decision on your own. That's not the Bible at all. You say, how do you know? Here's another verse. 2 Peter 3, 9. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us. Word. Listen. Not willing that any should perish but that all, what does all mean? It means A-L-L. -L. All means all, and it can't mean anything else but all. That all should come to repentance, not just the elect. So when God grants the Gentiles repentance, that has to do with, in time, Him progressively opening up the door of faith, as the Bible calls it, from the gospel moving from Jews over to Gentiles, corporately as a group. And so you want to make sure you understand that. And God wants people to repent. It's God's will. And just because people resist God's will doesn't... Um, and the, the fact that people can resist God's will proves that this idea of God's sovereignty from Calvinistic theology is not biblical at all. People can say no to God of their own free volition. If they couldn't say no, then anybody who did fall in love with God would have been coerced into it and it would not be true love. True love is out of choice, not out of being forced into it. And God is love. I'm glad I got that off my shoulders. All right. Now, what about this thing about repentance? It's preached in all the Bible. But repentance addresses three parts of man. Matthew chapter 21, verse number 29 Jesus Christ tells a parable here, 
And of course, see, there's two. There's uh, two sons. Let me get to it here. Matthew 21. There's two sons, and he asks the sons. He says to the first, "Go and work in the field." And he says, go work in my vineyard. Verse 29, he said, I will not. But afterward, he repented and went. And the second said, likewise. And he answered, I, said, I, I go, sir, and went not. So he's drawing a comparison. One of them said, I will not. He made a choice. And then he made a change of mind. And he said, I will. Here's what you want to understand. Repentance affects the mind, the will, and the emotions. There's a change of mind that affects the intellect. The gospel stimulates the intellect, but it also stirs the emotions, and it, it prods the will. You want to understand this. Uh, the will, uh, here's a good example, the prodigal son. He finally came to himself, and the Bible says that he said, the prodigal son said, I will arise. When Calvinism says that you're so totally depraved, you can't make a decision to receive Christ, they remove the free will of man. You do have a free will to either say yes to Jesus Christ by faith or to say no to Jesus Christ. And then we have the emotions. And I mentioned repentance is not just being sorry, but when you repent, you are sorry for your sins. In Job 42, verse number 6, when Job finally comes face to face with God, when God finally reveals himself in that whirlwind to Job, he says, Who is this that darkeneth uh, my words with counsel without knowledge and so forth? He says, Gird up thy loins like a man. He goes, Why don't you answer? Job says this, Job 42, 6, Wherefore I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. He says, I've spoken once and I'll speak no more. He says, I said, I spoke of things too wonderful for me. I, I spoke where I had no business speaking. There are some things that you try to get involved in in your mind, and you're thinking all off track because you're not thinking biblically, and you do not have the mind of God, and you are not a big think tank like you think you are. You better just say, you know what? My mind can't go that far. God's God, and I'm just flesh. I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. He changed his mind and what he was thinking. He was thinking, God, you don't care about me he was thinking God I'm righteous and when he finally had a revelation of God he said I didn't even know what I was talking about and he abhorred himself it bothered him now when a person comes face to face with the reality of God's righteousness and God's holiness his own depravity and sinfulness should bother him you ought to feel bad that you do wrong be sure your sin will find you out. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. It ought to bother you. Paul said, I was alive without sin once, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. And Paul, he had a low estimation of himself even after that, even after being saved. He said, the things I would, I don't do not. He said, oh, wretched man that I am. And that's an amen. You are a wretched person and so am I. When that commandment came, it showed Paul how sinful he was. And it shows you how, take the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not. You're guilty of every single one of them. And so you ought to have, there ought to be remorse. Your emotions should be touched by the righteousness of God. Now in 2 Corinthians 7 verse number 10, Paul makes the statement as he draws the illustration between godly sorrow and ungodly sorrow. There are people that are sorrowing and filled with sorrow that's not the right kind of sorrow. Paul says over in Thessalonians, when a loved one dies, it's a believer that we should not sorrow as others that have no hope. You will sorrow. You will have a time of grief, and that's okay. And you will go through times even dealing with just things in life where you'll be down in a low spot. You might be so low you can go under the door without opening it. Uh, we have times of sorrow. But we shouldn't sorrow as others that have no hope. But there's also a sorrow that comes about through repentance. And there's the wrong type of sorrow like we saw with Judas. But then we see the right type of sorrow that we see with Peter. Remember when Peter denied the Lord and he looked across the way as Peter was being led from one judgment hall to the next. And the Bible says the Lord turned and looked on Peter. And Peter went out and wept bitterly. Judas wept as well, but Judas went out and hanged himself. Peter wept and got right with God. 
godly sorrow worketh. 2 Corinthians 7 verse 10. Repentance to salvation. Listen, not to be repented of. But the sorrow of the world worketh death. When we study repentance as far as salvation is concerned, when you repent and turn to Jesus Christ by faith and receive Christ, it's a done deal. You don't have to keep doing it. It's not to be repented of. You don't have to keep repenting and repenting and repenting of being saved. Now, I hope this clears up some problems that people have with this word repentance. We see it on several different extremes. We have it on one extreme where repentance is given so much focus on that it's almost as if you don't come down and you don't repent of all of your sins and so show so much sorrow that you're so sorry that you're an awful sinner and cry crocodile tears that we doubt that the conversion was really effective because it didn't produce a lot of emotions. I mean, if God saved you from hell and you know what hell is, and He's going to put you in heaven and you see how great heaven is, it ought to stir up something, maybe a tear of sorrow, maybe a tear of joy. But sometimes it's just as if there's no, nothing there. And so we say, well, they never were saved. Then you have another extreme that says, look, you trust that Christ as your Savior, you don't have to repent no more. You have to watch that because that's not right either. First John says, if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Do you still sin after you're saved? Yes, you do. Your flesh still sins. I gave you the verse in Romans chapter 7. Paul says that in me, that is in my flesh, will have no good thing. If you still sin after you're, you set, you're saved, you need to repent. You need to have a change of mind about that thing. You need to see your sin in light of God's Word. And if your sin in light of God's Word, you're doing things that are contrary to God's Word, you need to repent from those things and go in a different direction. Now, Mark chapter 1, verse number 15, the Bible says uh, they were preaching there and said, Repent ye and believe the gospel. That's why I have repentance first, then faith. These are two sides of the same coins, but there's repentance and there's belief. Turn to John chapter 16. I hope to clarify some of this for you. John chapter 16. Because what happens is you have that other side of the coin. Uh, that's not the correct term. Or the other side of, of theology or preaching like I was mentioning how they say, well, you've got to come down and have some evidence of your salvation. This idea that you need to repent of sins and you need to do these certain things. If you're not willing to put those cigarettes down, to trust Jesus Christ as your Savior, you can't be saved. That is being preached sometimes. Or whatever you want to fill in the blank with. And they say we're preaching repentance. And if someone's not willing to repent, they can't be saved. That statement in and of itself is true. If you do not repent, you can't be saved. That's part of salvation. That's clear. I'm about to give you something to chew on for that. But what they will do is, in their mind, all they can think of is repentance is, you stop certain sins. That's all they can think of. Because you have a change of mind about something, so then you stop it. Well, there can be all kinds of things that you have a change of mind about. Now look over here in John chapter 16, and I want you to understand, when Jesus Christ rises from the dead, the issue in salvation is what we dealt with last week. The grounds of salvation is the atonement of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the focal point of everything in salvation is a person, Jesus Christ. It's not a work, it's not an act, it is not what you say or what you do. The foundation is Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. You've got to understand that. So if the person of salvation is of most importance, then what you do with that person is of most importance. Look in John chapter 16. Jesus Christ is speaking here of the future after He dies and rises from the dead. Verse 7, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin, because they drink and smoke and cuss and watch too much TV. Of sin, because they don't come to church on Sunday night. Of sin, because they gossip about their neighbor. Of sin, because they take too long breaks at work. Of sin, because they don't discipline their children. Of sin, because they cheated on a test. Of sin, because they lied about their taxes. That's not what it says. Of sin, look at it, 
because they believe not on me. Of righteousness because I go to the Father and you see me no more of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. The Holy Spirit will reprove the world of sin. The issue when the Holy Spirit convicts a sinner of sin will be his sin of, look at it in the text, verse 9, the sin of unbelief. You say, why do people go to hell? Unbelief. Uh, Revelation 21 is a good verse to use for people because it says, Revelation 21, verse number 8, but the, un, but the um, let, me, let me quote it, let me read it to you because I have it all out of order. Revelation 21, verse number 8. But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. So who deserves to go to the lake of fire? Well, I like to use the thing about liars. You know, who hasn't told a lie? That means everybody qualifies for the fire. But notice the text. The fearful. Then he says the unbelieving. Here's the thing. If someone dies without taking the medicine, the cure for the sickness, which is hell, we're moving beyond the physical part. If someone dies without taking the cure, they go to hell. What is the cure? The cure is Acts 16.31. We read it to start off with. What must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. If someone is an unbeliever, they die and go to hell. I didn't say if somebody never quits drinking and never quits smoking and starts going to church and somebody uh, quits uh, talking mean to somebody and quits gossiping. and Unbelief is what puts every sinner in hell in the church age. you got to get that. Look over in John chapter number 3. So we talk about repentance. What in the world does a person repent of in order to get saved? You say, well, when I got saved, I was sorry for all the sins I had done. Well, there might have been a few that really were brought to your attention. You know, the Holy Spirit will use things in our life to show us how bad we are. You might get in trouble with the law. There's sometimes you go to the jail and there's people because they did wrong and they got caught and got in trouble. They get broken and they realize they are a sinner. And God uses that sin to manifest the fact that they are a sinner. But they're not going to go to hell because they got arrested. <laughs> they're not going to go to hell because they broke the speed limit or got a, a felony or did whatever. They're going to go to hell because they die unforgiven. Because they die as an unbeliever. How do you get forgiven of your sins? You believe on Jesus Christ. Look in John chapter number 3. You got to get this because when we preach repentance, it, everything, the waters get muddied because the word repent is very broad here. I can preach repentance to Christians and we can be dealing with maybe the sin of the tongue. In the book of James, the tongue is a world of fire. Uh, it's, it's, it's untamed and we can preach on it. We can talk about uh, your, your tongue and how that you talk about people and we can preach about that. Hopefully propelling people to make a decision about some things and ways that they are getting into trouble with their tongue. Repentance. You can talk about all kind of sins. And a preacher ought to preach on sins. And you should repent of sins. But the water is getting muddy when you talk about salvation because does that mean I've got to come up, I've got to have a list of all my sins and then... Stop doing all of those sins in order to believe on Jesus Christ? Listen to me. I guarantee you there are several of you listening and watching that when you got saved, there were sins in your life that you were not aware that were sins. In your ignorance, you were doing certain things and you weren't completely aware that those things were wrong. The more you read the Bible, the more you came to church and you got exposed to Bible preaching, your conscience got more awakened. And the Holy Spirit and the Bible awakened your conscience. You said, man, I need to quit doing that. Man, I need, I need to stop doing that. That's uh, abstain from all appearance of evil. That may not, I may not have the wrong motive, but it doesn't look good, so I need to quit doing that. Well, you didn't know about that before you got saved, so if you didn't repent of that before you got saved, who's to say you're really saved? That teaching is preposterous. 
And what it does is it brings this emotionalism into the church. It's camp meeting type of preaching. They get these camp meetings and they get all these Christians in there and they've got to have all these conversions. So what they do is they retread people. They talk them out of their salvation. Bless God, if what you got won't get you back to church on Sunday night, what makes you think it's going to get you to heaven when you die? Bless God, when I got saved, I never took another cigarette, never smoked another one a day of my life. Bless God, when I got saved, God cleaned up my filthy language. I never said another curse word. And here's somebody, they you know had a flat tire and they got out and the, the, uh, they uh, tried to change their tire a week before and the, uh, the, the uh, jack fell and broke and, and, and their wheel got all busted up and they said an expletive. And they're sitting in the camp meeting and they're thinking, man, I must not have got saved. Whatever scenario you want to paint. Here's some woman and she's been um, despondent and she's maybe gone through some emotional things because maybe even postpartum they talk about when they, they have a child and they have emotional things and they begin to have these, these bad feelings and then the preacher capitalizes on that and starts talking about thoughts and say you're supposed to love your neighbor as yourself and esteem others better than yourselves. If you don't act like a Christian, what makes you think you are? Boy, that thing can really be driven. So then you have Sunday school teachers getting saved and pastors' wives getting saved and preachers getting saved and great revival breaking out. They finally repent of those sins. They're confusing discipleship and salvation. So what do you repent of when you get saved? You repent of what you think about Jesus Christ because the whole issue has to do with you and Jesus Christ, not you and what you've done. You're a sinner by nature. You can live a quote-unquote pure life, lock yourself in, in some monastery somewhere, be some monk and not be around and separate yourself from all these evils like Buddhism teaches. Atheism really is what it is. But you'll still die and go to hell because sin's in your nature. You have to believe on Jesus Christ in order to be forgiven. Now, repentance... Look in John chapter 3 is where I told you to go. You know the verse, verse 16, God so loved the world. Verse 17, God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. He that believeth on Him is not condemned, but he that believeth not, look at it, is condemned already. People grow up, and as they grow up, they grow up in unbelief, not in belief. There has to come a day in their life that they repent and have a change of mind and a change of heart to receive Jesus Christ. That has to happen. And that brings us to our next word, which is receive. John 1, verses 11 and 12 are great verses for this. He came into His own, and His own received Him not. But as many as received Him, to them gave He power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on His name, which were born. That's where we get the phrase born again which were born not of the will of man nor of the flesh, but of God. So receiving Christ is like receiving a gift. Somebody gives you a gift, you receive it or reject it. If someone rejects the gospel, they're not believing the gospel. And so the issue is the Lord Jesus Christ. Someone turning from sin without turning to God is what you call reformation. It's not called regeneration. But when you turn from sin... The sin of unbelief, which can include a whole lot of other sins with it. But when you turn from unbelief to belief, that is regeneration. Titus 3, verse number 5. So we're turning to Jesus Christ. And believing in Christ, that means you believe that He's your Savior. Not just believing that He's a historical person that existed. That's not what we're talking about. It's not this easy believism. Oh, do you believe Jesus existed? Oh, okay, now you're saved. Oh, do you believe, have you heard about Jesus Christ rising from the dead? There are millions of people that believe, that believe in their head that Jesus Christ rose from the dead, but they have never repented, had a change of mind, and trusted Jesus Christ. This has to do with turning from your own righteousness and accepting and receiving the righteousness of God, which is by faith. Look over in Romans <coughs> chapter number 3. Romans chapter number 3. That's why we went into great detail about the atonement of Christ. Jesus Christ did what He did because we could not 
earn our own salvation. He had to live the sinless life you couldn't live. He had to die a vicarious death on the cross as a substitute for you and His blood is the atonement for you so His righteousness can be applied to your account. His righteousness can be appropriated to you. You don't deserve it, but you get it appropriated to you when you believe. Look in Romans chapter number 3, verse number 21. We keep hitting this verse over and over. But now the righteousness of God, that's what you need. You need righteousness. How can you be right with God? We use that phrase. You need to get right with God. No unsaved person can get right with God until they believe on Jesus Christ for salvation. They can go up and reform and get rid of all these sins. Well, you need to get right with God. Yes, yeah, sinners need to get right with God. I mean, saints need to get right with God too. But a sinner getting right with God without getting regenerated and without believing in Jesus Christ, there's no new birth in that at all. Look in Romans 3.21, But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all, it's for everybody, and upon all, it's appropriated, upon all them that what? Believe. For there is no difference. Alright, so you have to receive Jesus Christ by faith. And the point is, there must be a definite time in your life when you turn to Jesus Christ and receive Him. Now, people get sideways on this issue. Oftentimes they, they go either one or two ways. We'll look at both extremes. They get to the one extreme to, that says, you're teaching that all you have to do is believe on Jesus Christ as your Savior, and you're not teaching repentance. So you're advocating a form of easy believism. And so people castigate people when they say that. And they say, you're saying that you have this form of easy believism, but somebody like, if we're accused of that, we would say, well, salvation is easy. It was hard for Jesus Christ. He's the one who endured the shame, and He's the one who went through the crucifixion and did all the work on the cross. It was His work. It's not our work at all. Yes, it is easy. We have to believe by faith. And there is repentance involved. There's a change. I know that I can't save myself. And I had a change of mind knowing I am lost. And I'm turning to Jesus Christ to receive Him by faith. Now the other side of that coin is someone that says this. Well, all you have to do is believe. And so as long as you believe, you're good. Do you believe? They say, yeah, okay, well, you're saved, you're in the body of Christ. Okay, well, are you sure there's been a conscious decision made? And this is where when you look at what we talked about in theology, evangelicalism, it has to do with the gospel, and it has to do with this other word I'll put up here, this word, conversion. All these... T-I-O-N words, expiation, propitiation, redemption, conversion. There's been a, you've been made a convert. You've converted from one way to another way. This is why in evangelicalism and even in Protestantism, however broad you want to make it, a gospel message will bring someone to a point of decision. And this is why the quote-unquote sinner's prayer became very popular. Because it could bring someone to a point of decision. The problem in that is, obviously, people will misunderstand, and people can misunderstand. They misunderstand all kinds of things. We've talked about baptism. We've talked about communion, the Lord's Supper, and how people misunderstand those things. We'll get into that more detail later on. Sure, people will misunderstand, and they'll say, Well, I prayed the prayer that the preacher prayed, so now I'm saved. Well, if that's what you're trusting in, and you're not trusting in the atonement of Jesus Christ, no, you're not saved, because there's not any magical words that save you. Lord, just forgive me for all my sins. You're trusting in just saying a prayer, and that God is just going to forgive you. On what basis is God going to forgive you? Do you believe that Jesus Christ's atonement is the way that God's forgiven you? Do you believe that it's His blood that was shed in your behalf, and that He rose again from the dead, and you can be forgiven that way? Okay. If not, just repeating some prayer is not right. And we know that there, has been, there have been abuses with that. However, you want to bring people to a point of decision. And I want to bring you to a point of decision if you're not saved. 
You say, well, I'm saved. Okay, when did you get saved? Well, I've just always been saved. Nobody's always saved because you're born into this world a sinner and you grow up an unbeliever. When did you believe and when did you make it personal? If you've met Jesus Christ, when did you meet Him and make it personal? When did you convert? When did you receive Jesus Christ? Repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. There's a turning from your own beliefs, your unbelief, your self-righteousness, and there's a turning toward a faith in Jesus Christ. When did that happen? If it didn't happen, if you haven't made a point of decision and you haven't nailed it down, there's no wonder that you don't have assurance of your salvation and you wonder, I wonder if I'm really saved, if I'm going to heaven when I die, and you have all these questions of assurance. The best thing that you can do is nail it down right now. If you've never made that decision or you're unsure about it, make the decision now. And there's nothing wrong in praying a prayer. As long as you're praying the right prayer. You don't pray, you know, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, now I'm saved. The Bible says that thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart. There's two things. There's a confession, but there's the heart belief. Believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. You say, well, what would I pray? Well, it, you have to know what you're going to pray, but you have to believe what you're praying. You talk, and you talk one-on-one -on -one to Him. You call out on Him the best way you know how. Something like this. Lord, I know that I'm a sinner, and I know I deserve hell. But Lord, I'm turning from myself and from my sin to Jesus Christ. I believe He died for my sins, and I believe He rose from the dead. And Lord, I'm asking you to save me. I'm calling on you to be my Savior. And I'm trusting you alone to save me. Amen. Just a real simple prayer. But the idea is that you can nail it down and you can say, I am a convert to Christianity, to biblical Christianity. I am a believer. I'm convinced that Jesus Christ died for my sins. And I'm convinced that He's my Savior. I'm a believer now. And you can write it down in your Bible. This is the day that I trusted Christ. That's why it's good to have a point of decision. So we've gone over appropriation, how to be saved. I hope and pray that you are saved. And if you're saved, you need to tell somebody. And you need to ask somebody else, have you been saved? And encourage people to trust Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. That will conclude our study on appropriation, how to be saved.